In this session, we're going to be looking at what is meant by the term programming paradigm. You should also be able to show an understanding of the characteristics of a number of programming paradigms, and these involve low-level programming, imperative, also known as procedural paradigm, object-oriented paradigm, and declarative paradigm. Now, chances are that you probably have utilized all of these, but you never thought about paradigms. And it might be the case that this is perhaps the first time that you encountered the term paradigm and you don't actually know what it means. So let's start by looking at the word paradigm first before we start discussing programming paradigms. The term paradigm means a typical example or a pattern of something, basically a model of doing things. In computer science, we use the term paradigm to describe an example of a way of doing things. So programming paradigm is simply a set of programming concepts. And these concepts are used for us to create programs. Now, the most common one that you would have encountered would be the imperative computing paradigm, which is writing things in a sequence. And we do that in almost all programming languages. You start with one, two, three, four, and you execute statements step by step. Now, most programming languages either use a single programming paradigm, for example, Java, or multiple concepts, for example, Python, we're going to be covering the following four types, low-level programming, imperative, object-oriented, and declarative. Just to iterate, programming paradigms are just an example of a way of doing things. So assembly language has one paradigm, which is low-level paradigm. It doesn't use imperative or declarative. Python has multiple paradigms. For example, it can use imperative, classes, and so on. And other programming languages would probably use a single paradigm, for example, object-oriented or declarative. Now, if you look at the evolution of programming languages, low-level languages were quite prevalent in the 40s when hardware was very bulky, RAM was limited, the specialist experts needed to know how to code. So at that particular point in time, our programming utilized assembly and machine code. Fast forward to the 50s, we now have transistor-based smaller machines coming through. Again, still experts were utilizing it, but that's when procedural paradigm took hold imperative programming paradigms took hold and languages like Fortran and COBOL were invented. Move to the 60s and that's when the high level languages started to kick in, BASIC and C. And then when we move towards the 70s, that's when object-oriented paradigms were invented, C++, C Sharp, those are the languages that took hold. And as we move towards the 80s, 90s and the 2000s, that's where high level languages evolved to use multiple paradigms and languages like Python came to the fore. So we can divide languages into two categories initially, low and high level languages. And we know this already from AS and A2. Hardware is the physical layer and machine language and assembly language are the low level languages that can run directly on the hardware. So machine language is very difficult to program in. It's basically binary assembly, uses opcodes and operands, mnemonics to ensure that we can interact and customize applications. So a bit better, but still very tricky, quite low level. Now machine code is the least abstract because you code in ones and zeros, and that translates easy into electrical signals, one for high voltage, zero for low voltage. Assembly, on the other hand, uses mnemonics, and each mnemonic matches a set of ones and zeros, and it's a one-to-one -one relationship. So programs are perhaps easier to code. However, this is where we need to use a translation software, so an assembler, is utilized to translate assembly code into machine code. And you already know about high-level languages. Each instruction could be related to multiple machine code instructions. So it has a one-to-many relationship. Due to the complex nature of low-level code produced, these are known as high-level languages. And we initially started with Fortran, COBOL, Pascal, C, and now we moved on to visual and object-oriented programming languages like Java, Python, Swift, Flutter, even Scratch, and Blockly. So what's happening is that the higher level languages run on a layer below that, which could be another high level language or assembly, and which is then translated into machine code, which runs on the actual hardware. So a lot of translation or compilation needs to happen when you're on the top of the stack, and that can slow things down. But it's a lot more easier for us to now program computers. So low-level languages use instructions from a computer's basic instruction set. Assembly language and machine code are two examples of low-level languages. 
We use these for specific applications. For example, when we want to write a printer driver, we want to be operating with the hardware layer. And in that case, we would need to use specific addresses and registers which are available in the computer. And these might differ from machine to machine. So whatever we do in one low level language cannot be utilized on a different type of machine. So what you code for a MacBook on a low level assembly language equivalent will not work for a PC, but it might work on another Mac. You should be able to articulate the advantages and disadvantages of low-level languages. So assembly language has the same efficiency of execution as machine code due to its one-to-one -one nature. It can produce very precise, locally optimized, and efficient code. It provides direct access to system-level features without having to go through a software interface. Again, this helps in improving the speed of the program. In essence, you are in complete control of your code if you're using a low-level language. It does have some disadvantages. For example, it's very machine dependent and it's very hard to code. Programmers who can often write assembly code are very rare, which is one of the reasons why high level languages were invented because we wanted a lot more people to learn how to program rather than just create a few specialists. Even in the hands of such talented programmers, code can be very tedious to write and very prone to bugs. Because it's very difficult to understand, therefore it can also be very hard to modify and maintain. And these are some of the disadvantages of utilizing low-level languages, which perhaps high-level languages ended up fixing. Now, before we move on, I just want to take a minute to do a prior knowledge check. You will be asked questions related to assembly code in the paper three exam. So just take a minute and ask yourself these questions. What are the different types of addressing modes? Do you remember them? What is meant by an opcode and operand? What is an instruction set? If you don't remember any of these, then do look over your notes, and when you're ready, continue. Now hopefully you've worked out those addressing modes, and do pause the video if you haven't worked out what they were, and you can go through them. So you have about seven addressing modes, absolute, direct, indirect, indexed, immediate, relative, and symbolic. Now you need to know these addressing modes because the next part of this continuous knowledge check will be working with an assembly language program. Now in an exam, you'll be given the instruction sets that you need to use with an assembly language program, and it should look something like the ones that you see on screen. You should be familiar with these from AS level, but if you're not, you might want to revisit them. However, you will be given these in an exam. In addition to that, you might get a section of memory which contains certain values. So here you've got some addresses which contain the following values. So address 230, contains the deanery value 231. Address 231 contains the deanery value 5. And you'll be asked to apply that program to this section of memory to work out an answer. Now, everything is pretty packed here, so you might want to rewind and see those screenshots individually. However, this is what you have to do. In orange, you have a set of addresses with the opcode and operand. On the middle and bottom right-hand side, you've got the relevant instruction set or assembly language commands that you need to apply. And on the top right hand corner, you've got the section of memory with some data in it. Now in this particular question, you need to give the value in the accumulator and the index register after each one of these have been executed. So let's do one together. Address 500 has the opcode LDM. And if I look on the list, LDM stands for load the number into the accumulator. Now the operand is hash 230 and if I look down on the bottom right hand corner hash is a deanery number so in this case load directly into the accumulator the value 230. So the accumulator will be 230. The index register value will be 2 because that's what's given to us at the beginning. Go through the rest of the program, use the instruction set and the data that's on the top right hand of the screen and complete the accumulator values and the index register values. Hopefully this activity will allow you to practice how to work with assembly code, as it's more than likely that you're probably going to get an assembly language type question in the paper three exam. Okay, let's move on to high level languages. High level languages fit into two types, imperative and declarative. Imperative is something that we've been traditionally working with. In computer science, it means the order of instructions. It involves making sure that the steps required to solve a particular problem are set in the right order. So step one, do this, then do this, then do that, 
in order to solve the problem. Declarative, on the other hand, the focus is not on what the program should be able to do step by step, but on what it should be accomplishing, what the goal is of the program. The sequencing is not important. So we don't care about how you solve it. We just want this result. So think about SQL. SQL is an example of declarative programming language where you can say, get these fields from these tables where this field is equal to this and put the results in ascending order. We don't tell it how to open the files. We don't tell it how to search the data, match the data, then put the results in ascending order. The compiler just knows how to deal with it. All we're specifying is the end results and the declarative programming language takes care of the rest. However, we'll leave declarative programming languages for another lesson. So for now, we're just going to look at imperative languages and the two main branches of imperative languages, which are object-oriented programming languages and procedural. Now the imperative paradigm is used in the early stages of teaching programming and is then developed into structured programming like procedural or object-oriented paradigm. We don't teach you how to create procedures early on. We just ask you to write sequences of code. And then we tell you that, okay, these sequences of code can be repeated so we can create procedures and functions, or we can end up placing classes and objects. Now these types of programs are small, and simple in scope and they don't really involve subroutines. So we just keep everything very simple when we're teaching you programming early on. And as you develop into competent programmers, we then start introducing procedures and subroutines and the use of modular code using classes, objects, inheritance and polymorphism. If you compare the features of procedural programming paradigms and object-oriented programming paradigms, you'll probably find that a lot of them are similar but there are a few distinct differences. For example, sequence, selection, and iteration, they are present in both procedural and object-oriented. So Java can still do sequence, selection, and iteration, which is loops, in addition to inheritance, objects, classes, and encapsulation, whereas procedural won't be able to work with classes and objects and so forth. When it deals with data, procedural languages use local or global variables, which are accessible to other parts of the program, and we use parameters and arguments to transfer the data between one subroutine and another, whereas in object-oriented paradigms, we do that, and we also use attributes and conceal them from each other through classes and encapsulation. The program structure for procedural involves procedures and functions, and object-oriented would use classes, methods, and instances. And the program logic is expressed in a series of procedure calls, whereas for object-oriented paradigms, it's based on models and behavior. So an object-oriented paradigm will be able to access a lot of the features of procedural paradigms, but procedural paradigms can't access the ones from object-oriented ones. Okay, that's all for now. Hopefully you understand what we mean by programming paradigms and you understand that there are two types of low-level languages, machine code and assembly language. You should be able to articulate the advantages and disadvantages of low-level languages. You should also be able to explain what the two types of high-level languages are and what the differences are between procedural and object-oriented languages. In addition to this, you should be able to manipulate assembly language programs and solve those based on a given instruction set and set of data. That's all for today. As usual, if you do have any questions, please do get back to me. Otherwise, I'll see you in the next one.